Hello everyone, it's Lennon, and today I want to make some correlations between the Anana story and the descent into the underworld and how that and what that means in terms of like shadow, shadow work. Because I love, uh, I, I feel like uh, all of us witches and all of us spiritual people, most of them, okay, I won't say all. We're like all students of Joseph Campbell. Uh, we, we take mythology and we're really able to be students of mythology and take the stories and we can really ascertain some things in, inside of mythology. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Now, I've been studying on my own uh, and doing my own shadow work with what the world is today. And it's been eye-opening for sure to basically notice what my shadow work is lacking. And that's, that's where the rub is. And so as a researcher, I started down these, these, this path of figuring out what the world, what the underworld is representative of. And I mean, you, we kind of already know, right? But it's, it's, it's nice to see certain stories and what the details in the stories could possibly mean. Okay, let me preface this whole thing by saying the purpose of this video is to tell a little bit of her like timeline story in terms of mythology, not in terms of deity. So like if she's your, you know, matron deity or just a, an a abstract deity that you happen to work with, that this video isn't about that. And I fully, respect that decision of yours if it is uh, if this is something that you pursue in terms of your spirituality that's a beautiful thing i wanted to just look at the her base story in terms of mythology and then link that to shadow work at the end of this so uh and that's just a disclaimer at the beginning here basically we have a nana okay and when she realizes her divinity by looking at her vulva. Okay, she's perched up onto an apple tree, looks at her vulva, notices that, recognizes it that as as divine. Now, I don't think that the vulva is, is the point here. I think that it's her intimate, hidden parts of herself. And upon awakening to them and noticing them and bringing them into the light by just like her Sheila Nagig type of a, you know, thing that she's doing, she recognizes her own divinity. Well, then she decides to go visit her grandfather, who is the god of water and wisdom, Inky. Okay? So knowing he's a god, he knows she's coming, he sets out a feast on the heaven table, right? So she ventures off to heaven. When she gets there, they're feasting, they're drinking wine, they get intoxicated together. Uh, it's just a great time, right? Well, as Inky is intoxicated, he starts bestowing all kinds of powers into a nana. <laughs> Like, here's truth, and here's perception, and here's sensuality and sexuality, and here's the ability to dis descend and ascend from the underworld, and just all kinds of these, and they're called me's, okay? So he's bestowing all these powers on her, and then Anana, <laughs> much like I would be, is like, oh, this is this is fantastic. Thanks for the visit. Bye. He's still sitting over there recovering, right? but she's just gonna take her powers and go. Well, once he sobers up, he realizes, oh, shit, what did I do? And sends people after her. Well, then when that happens and Nana realizes that he sent people after her, she gets angry. She's like, hold up. This is how it's gonna play out? Okay, fine. Ba really starts to travel then and finally lands on Earth in what we can what we consider modern day Iraq okay that's where she lands where she's at once she gets to this plane of existence he can't touch her he can't touch the powers he can't bring them back so what she does as I guess part of like protection of these powers she bestows these powers into a shrine right there in like I said modern day Iraq to herself and then on a shrine she puts all of her powers there which ultimately brings pros prosperity to the whole of Europe over time well, after a little while, having this power of perception from Inky, <laughs> in her intuitive mind, she hears 
her sister in the underworld lamenting and crying for her dead husband. Apparently, out of nowhere, we learn about Arishkagal that, and the fact that she's queen of the underworld and the fact that this husband we know nothing about is dead. So Inanna's like, look, I know this means death, but I, I, I have to be there. I have to be there for the funeral rites for Arishkagal's dead husband. I'm her sister. And I think we can kind of, uh, we can correlate that particular part of the story to how royalty may have lived, how, I'll say, I won't say royalty, nobility may have done things in terms of funerals back then in that time. Um, we can, I can go, oh, we can chase rabbits all day with the parts of these stories, but. So she goes to all of her family, tells them where she's going. And everybody is like, no, you know, if you do this, you're doing it on your own. This means this is certain death <laughs> and she doesn't care she decides to take her servant and confidant okay with her on this journey to the underworld to the gate of the underworld so she's really made up her mind to do this right I think that's the beautiful part right there is that she's like wait a minute you know my soul is crying out to be heard these hidden parts of my hidden parts of myself are crying out like, if you think in terms of shadow and what, like, Young says is that if we let it go, we will have those slips in our consciousness that come out. Those plays on words, like when we're in a conversation and we accidentally say something, that's our shadow part trying to get out, like, clawing out of us. So that's, I think, ultimately what's happening here with Arishkagal is that these, these parts of her are eating their way out because Anana's just said, fuck it up until this point. <laughs> so... She finally decides to make the decision to descend and work out the problems, right? Now, what ultimately happens is she gets to the gate. She tells her ser this servant, Ninshaber, okay? She tells Ninshaber, look, if I'm not back in three days' time, three nights, three days' time, go to my family. Or she has a set of things for her to do. She wants her to lament for her at her shrine, beat the drums. It specifically says beat the drum, and I'll tell that in a second. And then, and then if that does none of that works, then go to my relatives and demand re retribution. <laughs> so, so she goes, right? She gets to the gate. The people, uh, these, I guess the underworld people, the underworld minions, I'll say, they go and tell Arishkagal, Anana's here. Probably surprised as hell that Anana's finally able to make the decision to descend. And Arishkagal's like, all right, here's what she needs to do. She needs to let go of these, all of our articles of clothing and then be bowing low before she comes into the main chamber. So they're like, okay, you know, fair enough. <laughs> and then goes to the main, you know, the outer gate, the outer, way outer gate. They tell Anana, look, you can come in, but this is what you have to do. And don't question our the way we do things because it's perfect here in the underworld. Anana agrees. She's like, okay. So they get to the first gate. And at every single gate, there are seven. So at each gate, okay, that like I said, there are seven. Now, let me back up a second. I'm so sorry. Anana is dressed to the nines, okay? She has seven articles that she has brought with her. A like a royal purple robe that she's wearing, a breastplate that says, come in, come. Uh, I think that's her sexuality. I think that's representative of that. <laughs> Lapis lazuli necklace, uh, gold bracelets. I mean, she has artic actual articles of clothing that I think are representative of her main, se her seven main powers. And so at each gate, she has to lose one. And the, the keeper there like, I'm envisioning him to be, like, kind of like a Chiron character. They tell her, you have to, you have to shed your robe at this one. And at each one, which I find really interesting, at each one, she asks, why do I have to do this? Every single time. So, they're like, don't question us, it's perfect. Don't question us, it's perfect, right? So, I, I find it so interesting that she has to ask, why do I have to do this? Which to me is almost like her fighting with herself about losing aspects of herself. 
which I think is a beautiful representation about how we push back on ourselves when we encounter the shadow. So anyway, so she finally gets to this main chamber where Arishkagal is, and she's bowed low, she's naked. Arishkagal notices her, she's bowed low, she's naked, right? Well, the final thing, the final thing that happens in, in terms of the underworld, okay, is like the final blow, I guess you could say, is that the judges, okay, the judges of the underworld noticed Inanna. They're like, okay, you humbled yourself. You have shredded the things about yourself that aren't necessary for the underworld. You have to die now. So they pass judgment on her. She's guilty. You know, immediate, immediate condemnation, okay? And Arishkagal comes over there, bestows her the evil eye, which is basically marking her for death, okay? That's what the evil eye was back in that time. We've, we've, we've done all kinds of things with the evil eye so far in the centuries. But, so, they Arishkagal bestows her the evil eye, marking her for death, then beats her to said death, puts her corpse onto a meat hook on the wall. What I think that means is that she's lost aspects of herself at each gate. There's actual reluctancy there. She stripped herself of her own identity. Or the things that she thinks are, are her identity. These seven aspects of herself that she really associates with. She's like, yeah, that's me. When in, in actuality, it's not. Those aren't really her identifying qualities. So she sheds them, right? It's like shedding parts of the, you know, your ego. And I think the ultimate battle that's where Arishkagal kills her, beats her to death, is that ultimate battle with yourself, with your own psyche. When you go, that's like the monster in mythology stories to me. When you descend to the underworld, you have all these little things that you have to do, like these little demons and little minions that you have to fight, but then there's one big monster, it's like a video game, one big monster at the end. That's the ultimate battle with yourself. Like, once you're shredded of all the things that you think identif you identify as, once you've sh shredded that and the ego is bare, there's one final stand. Your pride has one final stand to stand up and say, I just can't let this go. I can't. It's almost that part in the Garden of Eden story that where they feel shame. It's like that 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 last part you don't want to let go of. You don't. So you fight and fight and fight and that last battle is the biggest battle because you're like, shit, I've shedded all this. I've thought I've done the work. Like you probably first or second gate in sh into shadow work think you're done. But the, the real work, the real uncomfortable work, the real hard work is at the, as at the last battle. You have to go through stages to get to the last battle. And the, the picture that is painted in, when I see this story play out in my mind of her on the meat hook on the wall, it's reminiscent to me of almost like the Jesus story, really, but almost like for all to see, you're just like everyone else that type of a, that's what's happening with her having, with her just laying there on a meat hook. Is that like the death card in the Marseille kept coming up when that, when I was reading that part of the story, I was like, like kings and gods and everything, everybody dies. And that's where, that's the part of the story that, that I kept going back to the death card in the Marseille where he's got that scythe and it's like, everyone's going to get cut down eventually. So anyway, she gets resurrected by Inky with, you know, he, he manipulates the dirt under his fingernail, makes demons, these tiny fly demons that go down, sy sympathize with Arishkagal uh, to eventually get an honest corpse that they bestow the water and food of life onto her to resurrect her. And I thought, okay, well, what are the sympathizers? What are the two demon entities that fly into the underworld for Inanna 
are sympathizing with Arishkal. Now, who is Arishkagal in this in this instance when we're talking about shadow work? Your bare soul, your that part of your unconscious that is nothing but you. And it's like rebuilding yourself. Re those entities are sympathizing with you. It's almost like reawakening you to an, as a new person. And you, as a rich girl, are sympathizing with them as well. You're mirroring each other in order to begin again, begin anew. I love the story of the underworld being synonymous with shadow work. Because that's the dark place, right? It's really easy to make the connection. And it's a place where the ugly goes. And it's a place where the shadows lurk. And the sludge and the unconscious, right? But I thought that that was such a genius thing to... A genius term to use. Because the shadow isn't in the light. The shadow is over your shoulder, right? And it's really easy to just shove shit back there and forget it's there because you're really never facing it. And the ultimate battle really with yourself is rearranging yourself so that you can see that. And, and, and the fact that it's back there, right? And I'm standing in the sun and I've got a long shadow behind me. The battle is, is rearranging yourself to go to the shadow but I don't think it's meant to happen all the time. I don't think it's, I mean, I think we're meant to have some sort of pride, some sort of ego to back up our personalities, okay? But in reality, it needs to be something that comes to the forefront every so often. You know, something that you actively have an active practice with. It's like making the effort to the underworld needs to be a decision so that your unconscious mind or the shadow doesn't grow into the monster. That's the goal, is not to let it turn into this big monster where you have all these slips of the shadow. I think that the descent is the important part and not stopping at gate one is the important part, is to realize that the uncomf the stages of the gates in this case, that those are levels of uncomfortability for me. And it's going to get worse and it's going to get worse and it's going to get worse until ultimately you have got to rearrange your whole thought patterning to be a new person that in her death it was a spiritual death it was the death of herself her death the death of her ego the death of her identifiers you know her identifying qualities that left her bare it's like the death of her ego no longer able to identify with those things like hiding behind those articles of clothing or those powers or those, that me, you know. I just wanted to come on and talk a little bit about Inanna and her story being just one of many that talks, you know, gives us rich sim symbology in terms of the underworld and the descent into the underworld and how that plays into shadow and how the purpose of the shadow and shadow, the shadow and the shadow work is to dive into those uncomfortable topics and to dive into the sludge that we don't even see. We're not seeing the sludge, okay? This isn't just slime on the table for us every day. You have to get there every day. You have to go through the gates and the uncomfortable gates every day. We have to lose those aspects of our ego every day. Every time we work with shadow work. I'm not saying every day. I'm just an example. If you have any questions, let me know. And I will leave some resources, as I always do, below that I have been checking that I have been checking out in terms of um, in terms of Inanna and the descent into the underworld. Uh, if you have anything to add, any resources you'd like me to check out, please leave them below. I'd be much obliged. And I hope to see everybody again when we dive into some more juicy topics like this. Much love.